morning and welcome once again to Meet the Leaders. I'm your host, Terrence Micus. New York State Senator Greg Ball has been in that position since November 2010. Before that, he was an outspoken New York State Assemblyman standing up for the things that he said he believes. Now he's been appointed as chairman of the uh, Homeland Security uh, Council in New York State right in the time when Osama bin Laden was shot and killed. We're going to talk to him right now. Timing is pretty amazing. You held... Um, you held hearings for the, uh, the Commission on Terror in New York State. And then some months later, of course, this happened. A lot of the things you talked about that people were saying, oh, come on, he's being too dramatic, sort of came into play, huh? Yeah, it's actually pretty pretty scary. If you look at the uh, what came out of the hearings, the, some of the media try to focus on these hearings being anti-Muslim, which is absolute garbage, absolute rubbish. Um, we focused on some very serious details, the fact that um, uh, there's lack of security at uh, the George Washington Bridge, our tunnels, the Lincoln, the Holland. Uh, the fact that I went with Eyewitness News, we drove under the Port Authority bus terminal, the busiest bus terminal in the United States of America, um, drove right under it, no security. We drove by guard shacks that were built in the aftermath of 9-11 that were completely empty. Um, after we did that and exposed them, and the, the Port Authority is not an easy institution to embarrass, they put uh, people in there. JFK Air Train, it just came out that they were seeking uh, on the 10-year anniversary uh, to hit our rails. JFK Air Train drives under LL Airlines. Absolutely unsecured, no baggage checks going on. So, you know, now this has been heightened now that we've killed uh, Osama bin Laden, but at the end of the day, we are still not where we need to be. All right, so let me ask this. We knew this was happening, and of course, there were many um, possible terrorist attacks, even in New York City and throughout the country, that were stopped because of surveillance. Right. Big debate by. Um, uh, people about how much surveillance there should be, you know, constitutional rights. It's a, it's a legitimate debate. Sure. Um, but that's how we found out how a lot of these things were going. Why did all of a sudden things get lax, especially in New York City where the attack was taken? What happened? It's very easy to allow the, the passage of time to lull uh, everyone into a sense of complacency. And while we saw 3,000 souls uh, perish, uh, many people have forgotten those images. And the, the red, white, and blue flags that were on many cars are now either left fell off of the car wash or now, you know, gray and yellow, and people have really forgotten. And, you know, we have a, a metropolitan, a cosmopolitan city in New York City that is open and is bustling. It also, outside of Jerusalem, is terrorist target number one. The reality is, is that those who seek to destroy the United States of America are likely to use New York City as the vehicle to do so. And while we need to make sure that that city remains open, we also have to know in a post-9-11 environment who's coming in, who's coming out of the city and doing everything we can. You know, in lower Manhattan, they've done a very good job. And the NYPD, under the leadership of Ray Kelly, has done a phenomenal job. But we have secured parts of lower Manhattan to the extent that we need to. But it shouldn't stop there. It shouldn't stop in the financial district. It's got to, it's got to push north. Why you? I mean, there were so many committees you could have been on. You're, you're a, uh, they would call it a freshman senator, though you certainly got involved as an assemblyman in a lot of issues and took the forefront on a lot of those issues. You ruffled a lot of people's feathers, right. but you said, I'm going to stand up for what I believe, and you were elected. But why you in the area of terrorism? What was the connection? Well, I, I can tell you that personally I reached out uh, to uh, Majority Leader uh, Dean Skelos and I asked for this committee because it's something that I feel extremely uh, strongly about. And going into the 10-year anniversary, uh, we have other states and other cities at much less security risk that are receiving uh, millions and, and uh, we've seen billions of dollars spent. You know, the, the Federal Department of Homeland Security has really become a cash purveyor of pork uh, to states at much less uh, risk. And I asked my leadership for the opportunity uh, to lead this, this committee. Uh, and I view this, I know I have a lot of responsibilities as a senator. This is my most important uh, responsibility to, to this state. And what is your relationship to this committee, to the other senators, and also to the federal government? Obviously, as the head of this committee, you have a very direct link to our liaison, a congressional liaison to, to, to uh, Congress. Congressman, yeah, well, you know, Congressman Pete King uh, and I have a very good personal relationship, and uh, that's being developed. And uh, I think we, we now, for the first time in a long time, have real coordination, uh, at least at those levels, which is great. Um, and. Uh, you know, we have got to get, as far as the rest of the committee, I've bent over backwards to make sure that this committee is not seen as a, as a partisan committee in any ways. Because as New Yorkers, we're the ones, even on MTA security or, or Port Authority, you know, the radio interoperability issue, the fact that men and women died on 9-11 because radios didn't work properly, that's still an issue today. 
Yeah, you know, going into the, the uh, anniversary of 9-11. So we have a joint bipartisan letter signed by every member of the committee, even Senator Eric Adams, who, you know, uh, put on a little bit of a show at, at the hearing down in New York City. So we're doing everything we can in a bipartisan way. Why way. do you feel that the hearings, that because you, you, you talk tough a lot of times on these issues, and it's not that you're trying to be tough. I know you believe it. Yeah. But when someone talks strong about that, you get people that have other political philosophies that push back a little. But the issue is, as far as I can see, most of the attacks uh, that are terrorists come from radical, right. I will say, but Muslims, mm -hmm. or they claim the religion Muslim. They Look, may I use mean, separate, but, but you have to use that word. Why was there such a pushback? Where was the controversy? Where did it come from? Um, I, I, there shouldn't have been any. You know, we had somebody there named Noni Darwish as an example to testify. Uh, her father, she was from Egypt, her father uh, was part of the Fedayeen operations, but which by the very definition w were to bring about the complete destruction of, of Israel, death to Jews and all, all uh, uh, and Americans and, and basically all non-Arabs. So he, she uh, actually grew up uh, in a community where Sharia law was practiced. She saw a, a member of her household, not a family member, but a, a servant who was actually killed under Sharia law. Well, um, explain that for the audience, what Sharia law is. The, the concept of, of Sharia law, and, and there have been, you know, many people that have drawn attention to this in, in the sense of the hearing, but there are some people who are concerned uh, that, as we have seen in Europe, in certain cities, um, that those who seek uh, and have a problem with our culture would seek to bring Sharia law. Uh, and, and there are some very fundamental examples here. So it had to be at least discussed. What is it? Sharia law, uh, and, and Noni spoke to this uh, very eloquently, um, basically is a religious-based uh, judicial process uh, that allows the most extreme elements of fundamentalist uh, jihadists um, to uh, control even at the local level. And while we have not seen it laid out in the United States of America, Noni speaks to what has happened uh, in some European countries where you have entire towns that have been overtaken by Sharia law. And one last question on this because I want to get into nuts and bolts, taxes and things. The president um, did a good job on this. He got, he got his man. You know, I think that what's going to come out and what people are, are going to begin to understand is that all of this starts, uh, there's a starting point that far exceeded the, the past week. Um, and many of the, the uh, intelligence capabilities and uh, collection opportunities that we've had uh, were put in place in a previous administration. Uh, the special forces, military, our, our troops, the president himself deserve an enormous amount of credit, but at the end of the day, the reason why we got uh, th this horrific and horrible individual is because of intelligence that was gathered uh, during a previous administration using techniques, many of whom that have now uh, been called into question by certain people who want to really limit our opportunity to do s future operations that are, that are similar. So we've got to look at this very seriously and the fact that um, this is not a, a, an easy business and there are people who seek to destroy the United States of America, and sometimes that means killing evil people, and sometimes that means using means uh, to collect in information and intelligence uh, that we, we absolutely have to keep in place. And it did work this time. Um, let me get talk to you. We have a budget in place, and of course people are saying, all right, kudos to Governor Cuomo and, and the, uh, the Assembly and the Senate. They got one in place. Two years, we're going to balance the budget, both years. That means a lot of cuts. What kind of pain are you hearing across your district? You know, uh, and I'm the guy who stood up on my desk and said, uh, we, this is the nation's most dysfunctional legislature. Um, and I've got it, whenever I'm in front of a group, I say, look, we passed a budget on time in the Senate, we passed it early. Um, but that's not necessarily the most important thing, although that's our job. More importantly, it was a pretty good budget. It cut actual spending by 2%, which isn't just 2%. For people who, who understand Albany, the land that common sense forgot, we were increasing spending by 10 percent. So that's a real cut of approximately 10 percent. And then we cut state government operations by 10 percent. No new taxes and no backdoor borrowing. So it, we really have shifted that battleship in, in the right direction. And uh, I give this governor an awful lot of credit. I don't know whether he has photos of Shelley Silver somewhere, but he's been able to keep Shelley Silver in, in line where Shelley typically the 800-pound grill in the room. I mean, he typically would have just waited out a governor. He's been able to keep him in line. 
And in, in not to get too political, but the reality is that with our Senate majority, a Republican majority, if we didn't have it, we would have seen taxes increase and we would have seen backdoor borrowing and, and, and further debt, no doubt about it. So we're moving in the right direction. We've got to keep that going. What is it going to do for me? What's it going to do for the people struggling with gas prices? I know those two things can be dealt with separately, but what's it going to do for Mr. and Mrs. Front Porch? This budget sounds great. Yep. We're all struggling to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Just because we made tough, uh, as a direct result of making tough decisions this year, you're going to see an $800 million increase already in education funding next year because we're able to get our, our, our budget back in line. Um, uh, the personal income tax, everybody talked about the millionaire tax, but it was people making over $250,000 a year. You know, not uh, seeing that to be extended was one of the largest tax cuts in recent history in, in New York State. And you're going to see small business owners who we're now going to be able to employ more people and hopefully revitalize uh, that economy. And the fact that we have no new taxes in, in a state where we have just come to expect it as, as a means of operating, I think is a very good step. Now, we still have to go back and pass property tax uh, reform. Yeah. I'd like to see a property tax cap, um, but we need comprehensive school tax reform, and we've got to deal with the MTA payroll tax to, to help the self-employed small business owners, not-for-profits, municipalities. All right, so let me talk to you before we go to break, because I want to get into the school property tax cut and the tax cap after the break. I want to, mm -hmm. of course, get into a lot of the things you talked about, but the MTA. This gas price thing has caused that to even get more highlighted because people are saying, I can't drive down there now. I got this MTA tax. I'm getting hit from all ends. Small businesses, they can't, some of the ones that roll trucks are getting killed because mm -hmm. they have locked in contracts sometimes that so they can't even up their prices. Mm -hmm. And then they got this MTA tax. Is this thing just rhetoric or, or is there going to be a way to stop this and turn this around? You know, it, it sure as heck better not just be rhetoric because at the end of the day, it's extremely important to districts like mine. I know even Senator Lee Zeldin out in Long Island uh, is working very hard. And uh, so we have Senator Larkin, everybody in the Hudson Valley and, and, and Long Island and beyond. We've really got to make it a point of our conference to say, attach it to other issues as well and say, if you want X, we want Y and a full repeal of the MTA payroll tax is okay, why. So in another minute before we go to break or so. So the MTA payroll tax is in place. It's never going to sunset, according to, we don't have the votes to change it. There's no it. sunset on it. So there's no sunset, so that means it's forever. But exactly. Um, and, and the other reality, unfortunately, is this is why you should not introduce tax increases as a means to solving a problem, because it also represents now one and a half uh, billion dollar hole in a 13 billion dollar approximately budget for the MTA. So when we repeal the MTA payroll tax, not just about repealing it, it's about finding real solutions to fill in that one and a half billion dollar gap. That's why we need a forensic accounting of the MTA to show where the waste, fraud, and corruption is and uh, consider other uh, opportunities to, to make up that difference. People have been talking about a forensic audit, but it hasn't happened. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and I personally fought in this budget to get a forensic accounting paid for uh, in, in the budget. The assembly took it out, but it doesn't mean we, we have to give up. We've got to continue. And even the comptroller agreed to do it during his uh, re-election campaign, so he, okay. he better he ought to get to work and do it. So they're going to hold people to that? I, I am personally, and I'm going to ask that my conference do so, and I know throughout the Hudson Valley and Long Island delegations. We're committed to seeing that happen. Okay, we're going to take a break. When we get back, we're going to talk more with New York State Senator Greg Ball, represents the 40th district parts of Putnam, Dutchess, and Westchester County. We'll be right back. We'll get you moving. Because when you get moving an hour a day, you'll have more energy to do the things you'd like to do. And that's a slam dunk. Whether you like to shoot hoops. Nice shot. Or ride your bike. Kick the soccer ball around. Pop an ollie on your board. Play frisbee in the park. Or just have fun with your friends. Moving every day puts you on the offense. Towards a stronger you. And that makes you part of a winning team. So be a player. Be a player. Because getting active for at least an hour a day fuels your body and your mind. And that helps you keep your eye on the ball. Be a player. Move it your way and be a player. Get up, play, and move it your way. Check out how to be a player at letsmove.gov. Head online to get tips on great ways to get moving every day. That's www.letsmove.gov. <laughs> Let paint 
poisoning affects over one million children today. Just three granules of lead dust can harm your child. If your home was built before 1978, log on to leadfreekids.org. Smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. And welcome back to Meet the Leaders. I'm your host, Terrence Mike. As my guest is New York State Senator Greg Ball, who represents the 40th Senatorial District, which, of course, is a, you just joined us, represents parts of Dutchess, Putnam, and Westchester counties. And as we talked about, which we're not going to get into, you're the uh, chair of the uh, uh, Homeland Security yep. uh, Committee in, uh, in, the, in the state government. So tax cap. Yep. Nobody in this area that's watching this show knows more than those people in Westchester County, Putnam, Dutchess, yeah. and around what school property tax do to a budget, to family income, right. and to try to make ends meet. It's just been impossible, and it's all been rhetoric so for so long. Well, you know, uh, but we are gaining traction on, on the property tax cap, and uh, the, some in the community have said, look, you know, at the end of the day, we have a property tax model that is based on an agricultural system. And uh, most people don't milk cows or slop the hogs in the morning, yet we have a system that penalizes them for an appreciation of value over which they have no control. And you don't even benefit from until you sell your home, and these days you're not even benefiting then. Um, and we're not seeing the decreases when we saw the increases. We cannot sustain uh, continuing to be number one in overall taxation. Westchester County and Putnam and Dutchess are not far behind, but Westchester was just named again number one in overall property taxes in the country. In the galaxy, the right? I mean, it's scary. Um, and the single most important thing that we can do as a legislature to get the economy back and really make New York State open for business again is pass uh, property tax reform. Uh, that's got to come in the form of a property tax cap. It would, the governor's it would, on board? The governor says he's on board, uh, and hopefully he'll use the same skills that you saw during the budget process to make this a real priority. Now, in the Senate, we've already passed the property tax cap. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard cap. And uh, we're committed to seeing that through, but he's got to get Shelly Silver to do so in the assembly. But doesn't the assembly leader want some things on rent control and things like that? I mean, that's the kind of bargaining that goes back and forth, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit above uh, my pay grade. I, you know, they're two separate issues uh, it, at the end of the day. But you would think that on a whole host of issues uh, on the governor's agenda, because remember, the, the bill that we passed was a governor's program bill, that the governor would be working to making sure that he has another success story. So what do you think we should go back then? If it's not, if it's a wrong model, should we go back to an economic-based type of thing, income-based type of tax? I think that it, by having a property tax cap uh, in place and then by moving more towards a circuit breaker approach where according to certain income brackets, so seniors making under X amount, working families making under X amount, that you provide uh, tax that you, you know, a tax it's incentive. Serious. You don't pay anymore. Right. But you still have to, the government still has to pay for it, so they, the government has to find that money somewhere. But by, you know, by a couple of things. One is by moving more towards an income-based approach, um, we'll have more equity and fairness in the system. The other thing is that when seniors move out, uh, many times they're, it's a young family that moves in with a couple of kids. As cute and cuddly as those kids may be, $20,000 price tags on both of their heads. That's so, cool. exactly. So, it actually does make sense in more ways than one. Uh, forget about only the moral burden that we have to our seniors, not burden, but obligation to our seniors, but also the fact that keeping them in their homes to allow to age in yes. place, we save money in the long term uh, by just the same concept of, of promoting senior housing. So, we've got to think about that and, and uh, be a little more intelligent about our, our policies. So, do you think it can happen? This I have six, I have six weeks. Absolutely. The end of the session. Absolutely. That would be yeah. a huge. I mean, it wouldn't be. I don't think a tax cap is that is, is is what everybody thinks is the answer, but right. it's a huge start. Yeah, and and you know, a lot of the school districts now, because of the proposal of the property tax cap, many have come in under that two percent, and what people have to understand is that's all well and good now during this 
tough and crippling economy. But the reason why we would put a cap in place is just as we've seen in the past, when the economy begins to tick back up, those school districts, many of them are going to go back to double digit increases or eight, nine, ten percent. And that's simply unsustainable. Okay. So the tax cap will fix that. Okay. And then one more thing I want to talk to you about in terms of just cutting, cutting, cutting. But you know, when you cut, you're talking about people's jobs, mm -hmm. you're talking about a lot of other things, and you get pushed back, and it's difficult because people have families. You're on a commission called the SAGE Commission, which is the Spending and Government Efficiency Commission. Yep. Basically, the goal is, is to cut X amount of pork mess, you know, yep. duplication out of government operations so that you can have that money also. Yeah, the governor uh, put together the SAGE Commission, um, the Senate uh, majority member who's, who's on that commission, and he's tasked us with finding ways, to, there are over 800 state agencies. Uh, and uh, you're talking about thousands of jobs. And, and that's really the problem with expanding the size of government because as soon as you do that, it develops a constituency mm -hmm. and it becomes a living, breathing monster that's pretty tough to kill. Yeah. So you have, we have over 800 state agencies and he's tasked us with cutting it by 20%. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, everywhere you look, you're right because you have political patronage, uh, you have constituencies that, that have developed, um, but uh, we're committed to doing it. We're gonna have our first recommendations uh, and vote, an up or down vote by May 31st. And what are those, uh, you know, what are those We're recommendations? We're going through those right now. Paul Francis uh, is leading uh, from the governor's office. But like office. an example, what example would be of a cut that someone in your district would say, oh, I understand that, that yeah. I can relate to that? We, I'm not, I'm not trying to, trying to evade, but everything, the proposals that we're putting it's forward. the table and you right, don't want to, yeah, okay. And, and, you know, you have, when you have 800 state agencies, Hudson Valley Greenway, okay? Uh, extremely popular uh, for good reason with, with many groups. Um, some feel it has outlived its, its usefulness and could be better served uh, 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 under one of the environmental agencies. So th that's an example. But each one of these agencies has developed a constituency. Right, and, they're, <laughs> and they fight for and it. And now they're going to call my office. <laughs> but, see, that's, but, but that's what you're used to because that's what you are. You're that's a right. senator and you always, you stand out on the issues. You don't try to sit back on them you, right. and that's, you know. And that's why you know, uh, the majority leader appointed me to this, the uh, SAGE Commission. And I think we're going to see some, I know we're going to see some real savings. And, and it's important. And there's a, a report in the New York Times on the SAGE Commission where a very small example of what we're spending over a million dollars a year on kosher hot dogs for, for prisoners, um, but there's, I think it was over 3,000 different, uh, the 800 agencies uh, get uh, pencils from like 300 different suppliers. Um, so just on purchasing and some common sense things, we can do a better job and, and, and save money. Well, it's minutiae, but it when it up. comes to bu budgets, it adds up. So let me just talk to you about uh, Dutchess County for a minute, and then we'll go into Putnam and Westchester. What's your relationship like with the people in Dutchess County? Are you getting a sense that uh, taxes, at least on the county level, that's the smallest portion of anyone's you know, tax bill, mm -hmm. are um, in a good spot? I mean, you got, they're not bludgeoning, right? Because you okay, said we, Westchester. We have, a, we have a, 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 well, look, I mean, Dutchess, Putnam, and Westchester pay some of the highest property taxes uh, in, in the country. But at the end of the day, that's uh, the state legislature's uh, fault, 70% uh, of it because of the school, you know, the school tax formula. Um, I have a very good relationship. I'm from Pauling. My family's uh, in Dover. Um, uh, my aunt and uncle had a, had a dairy farm uh, in Amenia and, and an auction house. So I have real strong connections all throughout uh, Eastern Dutchess. Very good relationship with, with uh, Assemblyman Mark Molinaro. Hopefully will be our, our next county executive. Uh, absolute great guy. He actually sat uh, to my right uh, in the assembly. Uh, very good relationship there. Putnam County, we have Mary Ellen O'Dell running for county executive now, the second time yeah. now that Venue has have been. You, a, have you talked to, to, to just quickly Senator Libel at all? Uh, no. Uh, he was given one phone call and it wasn't to me. No, mm -hmm. just kidding. We, ne we never had that good of a, a relationship, unfortunately. Nobody really understood the battle that was going on. The corruption in Putnam County was deep. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of people, for good reason, gave the senator the, the benefit of the doubt because, look, in, in any person you have good and bad, he did a lot of good. Yes. Um, he did a lot of good for veterans yes. and seniors. At the end of the day, he was taking his, his cut. I knew that, and, and that's why I fought to expose that. And it made a hell of a battle, uh, and it was not an easy thing. And I can tell you now, 
we're all working together. I mean, it is really great throughout the Hudson Valley, specifically in, in Putnam County, working with the sheriff, the, the current county executive, the, the future county executive, the entire, entire county legislature. And uh, it seems like a new day. It's a new, it really is. It, it's a new day, and it's better for the taxpayers and it's better for the people. Mm -hmm. Because before you had, you, we had a senator who was in control. Uh, he micromanaged, and he was trying to move the money around. So he viewed people as chess pieces. And I refused to be a chess piece. Uh, and uh, there was one moment uh, when I was the assemblyman, he pointed at my chest and he said, we're going to have a crib death on you, uh, which was a very, you know, what a wonderful thing for your senator to say. But, but that's all gone. And it really is great to be able to work together and to not be talking to a county legislator and have them fearful that if they do the right thing, they're going to be on the ounce with the, the senator. Yeah, it's a, it's a sad ending to a good career, but, uh, but you know, we, we, it is. we'll move on to that. And in Westchester, is Rob Astorino making them not the most taxed car? Uh, in, in you know, Rob's doing a great job, and I, and I think that uh, that's an individual who, you know, it's, he, he kind of has the persona. He, he does look, I think he looks younger than me, even though he's older. Looks like he just got back from, I joke with him, I'm like, Rob, you look like you just got back from Bible college, and you can do no harm. And I think it helps him, because he's making some very serious cuts. He's reinventing Westchester County government. He has uh, the independents and, and uh, a lot of taxpayers in Westchester County solidly behind him. Uh, but at the end of the day, Democrats outnumber Republicans in Westchester, I believe, two to one. So he has a very tough fight, and there, there are core constituencies there uh, that he's had to ruffle some feathers, but he's, he's staying firm and, and doing a great job. Have you changed a little about, you know, when you were in the assembly, you were like, you know, you know very, uh, you know, you rubbed, rubbed people sometimes, you know, rubbed their feathers, ruffled their feathers. As a minority, as an assemblyman in the super minority, if you're not standing on your desk and screaming at the top of your lungs, you're not doing your job because you have to leverage your bully, the bully pulpit. A lot of folks are not doing their job. But at the end of the day, I'm much more comfortable now because uh, actually working to get, it's one thing to stand. I've also learned in the assembly and uh, you fight the fight, but you don't have to fight every single fight for the sake of doing it. So what is different? What's, your, what's changed when you're in the Senate? What, what is the, the, the whole culture? Why is it different? It's actually a great, uh, I've I had somebody uh, tell me, be, it's a great group. It's a great conference. You have some real experts of their committees campaigning on, on health. Um, that's just one example, but, but others. And we work together as a team. Even across Real, the aisle you work together. Yeah, you? absolutely. And, uh, and it, it really is an entirely different body. Where in the assembly is Shelly Silver. And you have a bunch of people that are scared to shake the boat. And you know what? That assembly chamber really needs people on both sides that are shaking the boat because you can't have one person who, who's ruling as a tyrant, which is what Shelley Silver does. And do you think Senator Klein and Senator Carlucci will be able to come along and really fight this property tax fight with you, along with you? Uh, th they need to, and I think I think they certainly will. And I, I believe that Carlucci is a huge district. It's a huge issue in, in Senator Carlucci's district. Well, we count, um, yeah. And we have the, well, those well, four independent votes, which are very important. Uh -huh. Got about 45 seconds here. What do, we, what do you see coming down the pike in the next uh, six weeks, some of the battles? You don't have to get on where you stand on it, but what do you think some of the things are going to be coming down? We have a uh, property tax cap. Uh, hopefully, will will become an issue uh, in the Assembly. Um, the SAGE Commission. Um, you're going to have the rent uh, control issues in, in New York City, which will be a huge issue. Uh, gay marriage will, will possibly uh, come up. Um, and I, th I think you're going to see a real push, hopefully, at least from our conference, uh, to focus on job creation and try to reverse the openly hostile environment for small businesses. Is Governor Cuomo aware of that, to, you know, to keep small businesses active so they don't leave or shut down? Governor or go Cuomo made a commitment on the property tax cap and on the MTA uh, payroll tax, which I really feel uh, he's got to stick to. Uh, and if we could do those two things, one, repeal some of these openly hostile uh, business regulations and, and taxes and repeal the MTA payroll tax, uh, we'd be going above and beyond just passing a balanced budget, but we'd actually be doing our job to create jobs in New York State. And New York State Senator Greg Ball, thank you for being a thank guest you. on Meet the Leaders, as always. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. I'm Terrence Micus for everybody here at Meet the Leaders. Have a good night. Tonight's news is brought to you by Davis Furniture. Visit us at our new location on the corner of Route 9.